our main message, which uh, is, as I said, part five of our, our study. Um, let's see. Hopefully you guys can see what I'm sharing. I will assume you can since I can no longer see. Well, let me, uh, let me get the chat up here. So in case anybody is saying something, I can see it. Okay, so we've been studying this chapter 68 of uh, where the carcass is talking about uh, Joseph and the coming judgment by uh, what the author is interpreting as Russia and uh, the hordes that come with Russia as Gog and Magog. So this uh, is really uh, section three of this whole study um, that we've covered in, in, in total five parts. Um, and it covers the day of God's fury, which Ezekiel is dealing with at the end of chapters 38 and on into chapter 39. And it's this battle when none shall help uh, Russia uh, that Daniel foresaw. And the meaning of the words Valley of Haman Gog, as uh, many scholars um, attribute, is, is really multitude of Gog. That's what Haman Gog means, multitude of Gog. And the prophet Joel in chapter 3 tells us that uh, the multitudes in the Valley of Decision for the day of God Almighty is in that valley. You can see that in, in Joel um, chapter 3, verse 2. He says, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my heritage Israel, because they have scattered them among the nations and have divided up my land. <clears throat> but this... Uh, this valley spoken of here in Joel is also called um, the Valley of, uh, of Judgment uh, and here called the Valley of Jehoshaphat. And it's, so it's, it's not here called the Valley of Haman Gog. It's called the Valley of Jehoshaphat. And this name Jehoshaphat means Yehovah has judged. And this name applied here is appropriate because God's anger toward all nations at that point in time is to bring down judgment, right? And that's what's happening here. The day of God, the, that great day, is to bring the nations forward to face their final destiny in the earth and that final judgment. And he, Yehovah, is going to judge them in the Holy Land, which was once given to all the tribes of Israel. Now, we mustn't confuse the Valley of Jezreel and the multitudes brought to that place with the Valley of Haman Gog and the multitude gathered there. Both ancient and modern scholars have sometimes identified the Valley of Jehoshaphat with the Kidron Valley, which runs between the east walls of Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives and continues a twisted course to the Dead Sea, approximately three miles in length. Now, the Kidron Valley, which separates Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, was a common burying place in early times, which included Gethsemane, where Jesus' body rested for three days and three nights. And God's fury on the day of the Lord God, the day of Yehovah, or um, Adonai, um, not Adonai, but uh, Yehovah Sabaoth, 
the Lord God, is when he will confront all the children of Israel, all 12 tribes, and the other warring nations of Gentile and heathen descent. And he's going to argue his cause for his plan spoken by the prophet Hosea in chapter 1. Now, this great prophet explains the situation in verse 2, which is Israel's punishment for departing from God. He goes on to explain how the ancient kingdom of the house of Israel, this second kingdom of ten tribes, ceased to exist. God broke their strength with him as a whole people, taking them utterly away, and that strength was broken in the valley of Jezreel. But upon the house of Judah, the first kingdom of three tribes, will mercy be granted, saving them by means of the Lord Jesus Christ from out of Judah, and by no other manner throughout the centuries. There's no other mechanism through which the house of Judah is saved or deliver. Yet despite the house of Israel's punishment and dispersion into the Gentiles, they grew nevertheless into a multitude of peoples within nations. Right? Just and it's 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 kind of a parallel with the way God protected the house of Israel within Egypt. And they grew into a, a multitude. It's kind of the same concept. Both houses of Israel must enter once more into the valley of Jezreel at the end time so that God can restore his bow to the house of Israel. And there, God will fight their battle for them, bringing out his anger to an enormous degree. As stated by other prophets, then Armageddon is upon all nations. In the valley of Jezreel, God will say to the house of Israel, who lived with the Gentiles, you are the sons of the living God. Then both houses will amalgamate in peace under the Messiah, who is our Lord and Master and High Priest, Yehoshua the Christ, or Jesus the Christ. And therefore, because the judgment upon Israel and the nations has been passed in Jezreel at that time, Jezreel is both the valley of decision, spoken of by Joel uh, in Joel 3.14, and the valley of Jehoshaphat, or valley of judgment, spoken by Joel 3.2, which we just read. Because both Hosea and Joel speak of God pleading the cause of his heritage, Joel 3.1 continues to set the stage of world affairs at the end time for the house of Judah, or the Jews. That is before God pleads the cause of the second house of Israel, which is Israel, right? The, the northern ten tribes. And we're told in verse 1 that at the time of the judgment upon the nations at Armageddon, Judah's captivity, amongst other nations, has ended. When some of the Jews, with the holy seed called Jerusalem, have once more been returned to their own land and once more have set their roots downward. The valley of Haman Gog is neither the valley of Jezreel, nor the valley of decision, nor the valley of Jehoshaphat. So what of the Kidron Valley? Though the Kidron was once the place of common graves in ancient times, it will not be the place for millions of dead bodies because it's too close to Jerusalem for, you know, standard hygiene purposes. Ezekiel 39, 11 through 16 purposefully states the necessity of hygiene, bringing into the picture the dreadful smell that multitudes of rotting bodies would bring and the noise of birds and animals fighting over the blood and flesh of carcasses. And I apologize for the graphic nature of this description, but this is what it is. 
seven months of continual employment to remove the dead is written for the house of Israel to perform that task. Therefore, the valley of the dead of Haman Gog would be much further away from Jerusalem and into the desert, which would be the correct choice. The valley of Haman Gog is also east of the sea from Ezekiel 39, 11. So which sea are we dealing with? It's not the Mediterranean Sea because that is west of Israel. So east of Israel is beyond the Dead Sea and into the Valley of Jordan. Ezekiel 39, 12 also tells us that seven months Right? It says, for seven months the house of Israel will be burying them in order to cleanse the land. Noting that the Jew of the house of Judah doesn't participate in this cleansing. Why is that? Because some of that people of the house of Israel brought out from all the other nations of Gentiles have now begun to return to the promised land of Israel. From Ezekiel 39 26 through 27 let's read that Ezekiel um, 39 26 through 27 <coughs> excuse me it says they shall forget their shame and all the treachery they have practiced against me when they dwell securely in their land with none to make them afraid when I brought them back from the peoples and gathered them from their enemies lands and through them have vindicated my holiness in the sight of many nations. Now, they've taken up residence with the areas allotted to them from, the, you know, from history, from days of old. And others of this nation will bury the dead in the Commonwealth countries of Israel, British stock. And we've talked you know, at length about, um, you know, the, the history of the, the British Isles and, and uh, the United States here. The old division of the tribes into their sections of land after the exodus out of Egypt allotted a great chunk of present-day Jordan, which is Moab and Ammon, or Ammon, uh, to Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh. Then on to Dan further north, who are tribes from the house of Israel. So the valley of Haman Gog, east of the Dead Sea, um, looks to be more in the lands held by the tribes from out of the house of Israel within today's country of Jordan. This is why um, that or this is why um, these two reasons and for these two reasons, only the house of Israel buries them. And we also must bear in mind that God has also caused changes in the world's topography with earthquakes and mountain ranges flattened, making the valley of Haman Gog a special place set apart from others through destruction. See that in Ezekiel 38, 19 through 23. Let's read that. Ezekiel 38, 19 through 23 says, For in my jealousy and in my blazing wrath I declare, On that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep on the ground and all the people who are on the face of the earth shall quake at my presence and the mountains shall be thrown down and the cliffs shall fall and every wall shall tumble to the ground. I will summon a sword against Gog on all my mountains, declares Adonai Yehovi. Every man's sword will be against his brother. With pestilence and bloodshed, I will enter into judgment with him. And I will reign upon him and his hordes and the many peoples who are with him, torrential rains and hailstones, fire and sulfur. So I will show my greatness and my holiness and make myself known in the eyes of many nations. Then they will know that I am Echobah. I wrote a paper on that phrase, then they will know. Because it's only when we're dealing with judgment of this magnitude that people begin to come awake and acknowledge 
the sovereignty and supremacy of the Creator. It's kind of a sad testimony, really. So this, then, is the awesome picture told by Ezekiel of Russian of this Russian um, invasion and, and lust for power that will eventually fail utterly because prophecy is against him, right? You can't, you can't defeat God, and God already said this is what's going to happen. So Russian failure and that of the hordes with him is cross-checked with Daniel 11.45 with the words, none shall help him. Let's just take a quick look at that. Daniel eleven forty five. 45, and we've covered this before. He says, and he shall pitch his palatial tents between the sea and the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end with none to help him. None of those so-called friends are going to save him from what's coming. So let's Let's give a little bit of background and a little bit of history and a historical uh, description of Sheba and Dedan, uh, which we find in Ezekiel 38, 13, which says, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish and all its leaders will say to you, <clears throat> have you come to see spoil? Have you assembled your hosts to carry off plunder, to carry away silver and gold? to take away livestock and goods, to seize great spoil. From 1938, Saudi Arabia, under King Ibn Suad, adopted a friendly attitude toward the United States and Great Britain. He also supported the Allies, uh, the Allied cause in World War II, eventually declaring war on Germany and Japan. And Saudi Arabia joined the United Nations and the Arab League in 1945 and took a minor part in some of the wars with Israel. From the death of King Ibn Suad, Saudi Arabia has joined various treaties or discontinued them, one of which was cutting off diplomatic activities with Britain and France during the Suez Crisis with Egypt in 1956. The updating of their history can be done by the reader as time goes on and things change. So this is the basis of their modern history. And we know where we are right now with Saudi Arabia and how uh, President Trump uh, made a lot of inroads there in, in creating a peace between Saudi Arabia and Israel. Um, According to Ezekiel 38, verse 13, Sheba and Dedan are kinsmen belonging to the children of Israel through Abraham and are within the nations of Saudi Arabia. And these nations have now become rich with their oil, etc. And because theirs is a monarchy, they aren't ready nor willing to fall under the heel of Lenin, Marxist, or socialist imperial Russia, uh, which, you know, the United States seems to be running headlong into at this point in time. We pass on now to the merchants of Tarshish and who they are today, which is the next few words of verse 13 of Ezekiel 38. A merchant is one who carries on trade on a large scale, someone who exports and imports goods and sells wholesale. These words are relating to trade and commerce, mercantile, marine, or trading ships of a country. It's marketable goods on a trading vessel as distinguished from a man of war. Just like the word Sheba, there are a number of words similar to Tarshish to look into in scripture and history. The first one that comes to mind is the Tartars of Asia, which same tribes came out of Manchuria and Mongolia. The quote-unquote golden hordes so styled that swept Asia and Europe were part of the Tartars. The name was given at one time to the Turkish people, and today there is a Soviet Republic in Russia called Tartar. There is also a Tartar or, or 
Parbatre in Estonia, within the Soviet sphere, which dates from around 500 AD. Tardis, or Tardus, was an ancient town in western Syria, founded in antiquity and called Antaridus, as Tartus, it was rebuilt by Constantine in 8346, then occupied by the Crusades in the Middle Ages. And today, this is an area and terminal for an oil pipeline and is also an agricultural producing area. The ancient city in Cilicia, or Turkey, called Tarsus, was the birthplace of St. Paul, which was absorbed by the Romans in 67 BC but it remained a leading city for Greek learning and eventually became a leading city of the Byzantine Eastern Empire. And today, it's still a prosperous place for cotton milling and agriculture. We now come to Tartessus, or Tarshish, which is the town we are seeking. Tartessus was an ancient region and town in southwestern Spain and it prospered in trade with all nations, especially the Phoenicians and the Carth uh, Carthaginians. A thousand years or more BC, Tartessus in Spain came onto the stage of history as biblical Greek and Latin references speak of Tartessus or Tarshish as an importer an important trader, especially in tin. Now these people sailed into the Atlantic in search of tin. Uh, the exact location of Tarshish is, uh, is been debated and is in doubt, but it's, uh, it's generally put along the coast of Spain between Huelva and the Straits of Gibraltar. And history says that the Phoenicians from Tyre, which is Lebanon, arrived on the Spanish Peninsula shortly before 1000 BC. Other historians say the Phoenicians arrived around the 8th century. It was a thriving trade in metal, which attracted others like the Greeks, the Phoenicians, and the Celts. The Greek historians confirming the existence of great treasure in Tarshish of copper, gold, and silver. The Tartessus name was also given to a river apart from the kingdom. It's known that Tartessus was created by the ancient Iberians, or Spain, who developed a complex trade. They used iron, agriculture, fishing, mining, metallurgy, weapons, jewelry, preservatives, textiles, ceramics, pottery, and general commerce. Much treasure and artifacts from the 7th century BC have been found from this colonization far in the land of Castile. And we can read in Ezekiel chapters 27 and 28 of all this rich merchandise. To unravel the history of Tarshish is like trying to unravel who Sheba was because the ancient peoples were this or that parcel of land. I'm sorry, they were intertwined in commerce and in movements of peoples and changes in ruling this or that parcel of land. So when we, we look at uh, Tarshish in Spain, we're continually reading of the history of the Phoenicians and Carthaginians with a few Greek explorers thrown into the pot for good measure. And it seems that the Mediterranean in those days was really kind of a, a central hub or a hive of activity. So let's take a quick look at the Phoenicians. The name itself comes from the word purple because of the murex whelk used for obtaining purple dye for the manufacture of cloth. The leading cities of Phoenicia were Eridus, Byblos, Sidon, Tyre, and Akka. Eventually, Sidon dominated until the 10th century. Therefore, the Greeks used the word Sidonians to denote all Phoenicians. 
And we can read in history that during the times and reign of Queen Elizabeth I, the Duke of Alba and Sidonia of Spain was most prominent. No doubt his name being a leftover reminder of the Sidonians in Spain. Tarsus, Phoenicia, and Sidonia became interchangeable at times in its history. So the Assyrian invasion upon the Phoenicians stimulated them to colonize the Mediterranean. The effect of the Assyrian in that area is seen in Isaiah 23, uh, 13. And you can read all of that chapter and see how Tarshish, the Phoenician cities, Zidon and Tyre are interwoven with one another. And during the time of King Solomon and Hiram, king of Tyre, uh, approximately 1000 BC, this was the golden age of Phoenicia. And they were first and foremost commercially seeking, oh, can you, can everybody hear me now? I, I don't know why I'm fading in and out. I can hear you now, but you were cutting out there for a while. Uh, might be my internet acting up again. Apologies. Um, let's see. <clears throat> so this was the, you know, around 1000 BC was the golden age of Phoenicia. And they were first and foremost commercially seeking new markets. Therefore, new places would have had a great appeal to them and they obtained copper from Cyprus, silver, tin, and iron from Spain. They were timber suppliers and stone masons in the Middle East, and we see this in 2 Samuel 5.11, when the king of Tyre supplied King David of Israel with timber carpenters and masons to build him a house. And we also see in the days of Solomon, approximately 1000 BC, in the book of 1 Kings 10.22, Let's go there. 1 Kings 10.22 says, For the king had a fleet of ships of Tarshish at sea with the fleet of Hiram. Once every three years the fleet of ships of Tarshish used to come bringing gold, silver, ivory, apes, and peacocks. <laughs> so they pretty much traded in everything. We also read in Genesis 10.4, um, that Jabin, the son of Japheth, who also had sons called Elisha, uh, and Tarshish, Kitten, and Dodanin, uh, verse 5 tells us, by these men were the nations of the Gentiles made up. So the Tarshish people were Gentiles. And let's, let's read that. Genesis 10, 4 and 5. The sons of Jabin, Elisha, Tarshish, Kitten, and Dodanin, from these, the coastland peoples spread in their lands, each with his own language by their clans and their nations. These were the Gentile people, or were, were Gentiles. And they were also situated west from Palestine, as Jonah chapter 1 tells us. For Jonah tried to get away as far from God as possible, which would have been toward the west which gateway was the end of the world, would then seem to have been the pillars of Hercules or Gibraltar. Jonah took a ship from Joppa, which could only sail west as there was no Suez Canal in those days. That came later. Javan's son Elisha is believed to have populated southern Italy, Greece, and perhaps North Africa. Javan's son Kittim or Chitim, populated Cyprus and Greece. The prophet Isaiah in 23, 10 through 14, speaks of the slow destruction of Tarshish, even with Chitim. Let's look at that. Isaiah 23, 10 through 14 says, Cross over your land like the Nile, O daughter of Tarshish. There is no restraint anymore. He has stretched out his hand over the sea. He has shaken the kingdoms. Jehovah has given command concerning Canaan to destroy its strongholds. And he said, You will no more exult, O oppressed virgin daughter of Sidon. Arise, cross over to Cyprus. Even there you will have no rest. 
Behold the land of the Chaldeans. This is the people that was not. Assyria destined, uh, destined it for wild beasts. They erected their siege towers. They stripped her palaces bare. They made her a ruin. Wail, O ships of Tarshish, for your stronghold is laid waste. In Daniel 11.30, which we've already looked at and translated, speaks of the war between Greece and Turkey during 1821-1826. Let's look at that. Daniel 11.30 says, For ships of Kittim shall come against him, and he shall be afraid and withdraw, and shall turn back and be enraged, and take action against the Holy Covenant. He shall turn back and pay attention to those who forsake the Holy Covenant. Of Javan's last son, Dodanim, nothing really seems to be known in history. Um, so to unravel where Javan's sons put down their roots gives one an idea today as to what countries we're looking for in prophetic utterances. So Tarshish is a European town in Spain, and today there is a strong feeling through the many archaeological finds that present-day Seville is Tarshish of old. The ancient Phoenicians played a great part in the lives of Israel and eventually transported many of her sons and daughters by ships. Within the slave trade, which was rife at that time, whoever ruled and controlled land and sea, they were the ones that uh, were prominent. The Phoenician princess Jezebel, daughter of the Sidonian king Ethbaal, in 874 to 853 BC, married King Ahab, and, and West was just reading about some of that earlier, he uh, married King Ahab of Israel and during the time when the whole nation was divided in two camps. She brought into Israel the cult of one of the Phoenician gods, Baal, especially Melkart or Malkart and Athaliah. Jezebel's and Ahab's daughter was married to Jehoram of Judah, which Wes just read about today, and took the worship of the gods Baal to Jerusalem thereby sowing the seeds of inner destruction that helped to tear the people apart. Let's look at 1 Kings um, thir uh, 16, 31 through 32. 1 Kings 16, 31 through 32, it says, And as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. Right? Samaria was the capital of the northern ten tribes of Israel. So these things are all there for a reason. Look at 2 Kings 8.18. 2 Kings Chapter 8, verse 18 says, And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, as the house of Ahab had done, for the daughter of Ahab was his wife. And he did what was evil in the sight of Yehovah. And Wes just read that. So gradually through time, Tarshish and the Phoenicians spread out and trafficked as far afield as, as the Cassiterides or the Sicilian Isles, uh, and Cornwall in the British Isles. The Phoenicians from Tyre, by this time approximately 814 BC, founded the city of Carthage in North Africa, which is now the city of Tunis. The Phoenician ships sailed voyages for Nico II of Egypt between the 7th and the 6th centuries BC. And around 300 BC, Carthaginian ships explored the coast of Spain, Brittany, and visited the British Isles. And so this intermingling of the many merchants of other nations with Tarshish went on until the Tarshish kingdom, as such, fell. It's said um, that it came to its demise because of the growth of Carthage and the increased usage of iron everywhere. 
just so the Iron Age kind of played a part in the destruction of Tarshish. When Ezekiel 38, 13 speaks of the merchants of Tarshish, it is speaking not of Britain or Greece or whoever traded as merchants with them, but of present-day Spain. The British Isles and Spain have been locked in as enemies for many a century past and are still locked to do perhaps verbal battle over the same place, Gibraltar or Tarshish. And today it's an important seagate which Britain wants to hold on to and Spain wants back as part as being part of and parcel of their mainland. Here at Gibraltar is the seagate once held by the merchants of Tarshish, which Russia, called Gog and the land of Magog in Ezekiel, sees as great spoil of war. Indeed, if he controls this area, he controls the opening to the Mediterranean Sea. And all merchantmen carrying goods and men of war are at his mercy. In Ezekiel's verses in chapter 27 and 28, Adonai Yehovi passes judgment on present-day Tarshish, Tyre, and Sidon. The Zidonians and Tarshish of today are interpreted as the Spanish nation, who as uh, verse 24 of Ezekiel 28 says, have always been a prickling briar and a grieving thorn, whether it was ancient or modern history to the house of Israel, or whenever Israel's history was played out in Palestine or Spain or Tarshish. So let's now continue on with Ezekiel 38, 13 with all the young lions thereof, right? It says, have you, uh, have you come to take or seize spoil? Who are these young lions spoken of? We've already seen in verse 11 and 12 of Ezekiel 38 that we speak of the British Isles as a place of Israel to dwell safely through years of historical milestones. Now here in verse 13, we also have the word young lions. Um, it's another pointer and this 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 phrase here and its leaders is the phrase young lions in the KJB I believe let me look that up real quick apologize Just want to make sure I've got this correct before we move on here. Because sometimes the different versions are different. Yeah, so in the KJV it says, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish with all the young lions thereof. These leaders are the young lions. So who are these young lions? Right? We know that uh, they speak of Israel. And here in, in uh, verse 13, we have these young lions. And it's another indicator or pointer to the house of Israel and the British Commonwealth. So it's quite natural to jump to conclusions from this verse to say it speaks of Britain because men speak of England as the old mother lion and the young lions, her daughter dominions. This idea has been around for many years. And it's not enough, however, when unraveling scripture. You have to seek out the understanding if the proof is correct or to prove something is correct. The beauty and reality of proof is just magnificent in its unfurling of truth in scripture. So let us take a look at lions and who they are. 
So Jacob is the old line from Micah 5.8. In Micah 5.8 it says, And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the nations in the, min in the midst of many peoples, like a lion among the beasts of the forest, like a young lion among the flocks of sheep, which when it goes through treads down and tears in pieces and there is none to deliver. So in this verse of Micah's, there are two remnants of Jacob, Israel, right? So let's go, this remnant of Jacob shall be among the nations. So let's go now to uh, Genesis 49, 9, which says Judah is a lion's cub from the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion and as a lioness. Who dares rouse him? Right, so Jacob recognizes Judah's role in life directly from him, hence the words, my son. And he was hidden in the nations, right? That's what it says. And so Judah's uh, role is identified here. And again, Jacob says, who shall rouse him up? Or who shall rouse him? And what we're going to cover now in Nahum 2, 9 through 13, is not only the destruction of Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian Empire, in this chapter, but a continuation into prophecy and a continued destruction of Jacob and Israel, who are two nations in the earth at the end time of their days. So let's look at that. It says, plunder the silver, plunder the gold. There is no end to the treasure or of the wealth of all precious things. Desolate, desolation and ruin. Hearts melt and knees tremble. Anguish is in all loins. All faces grow pale. Where is the lion's den, the feeding place of the young lions, where the lion and the lioness went, where his cubs were, with none to disturb? The lion tore enough for his cubs and strangled prey for his lionesses. He filled the caves with prey and his dens with torn flesh. Behold, I am against you, declares Yehovah Sabaoth, and I will burn your chariots in smoke, and the sword shall devour your young lions. I will cut off your prey from the earth, and the voice of your messengers shall no longer be heard. Now when Nahum, the prophet, wrote these verses, it was around the reign of Hezekiah, which is around 724 to 695 B.C., and it was about 150 years or so after Jonah's prophecy on Nineveh. The divided kingdoms of Israel and Judah had been hammered by wars with Assyria who made inroads upon them, especially the northern kingdom of Israel. Syria, under Hazael of Damascus, dominated both kingdoms around 841 to 790 BC. Thus, they suffered humiliation. The hordes of the north against Israel, which were then uh, the Assyrians under Tiglath-Pileser III in 743 BC, plundered and pillaged both nations, especially the house of Israel. They took away people as prey and their gold, silver, and pleasant furniture. And again, the Assyrians returned under Tiglath-Pileser III in 733 BC and carried away captive many children to the northern towns, which uh, that story is told in 2 Kings uh, 15 through 29. Their faces were once more to gather blackness and their knees to knock with fright as those fearsome Assyrian warriors came again into Israel, this time under Shalmaneser V and Sargon II in 722 to 705 BC. Their capital city, Samaria, fell, and they took away the children of Israel out of their own land, then replaced them with people out of other nations, 
and took away the remaining treasures from 2 Kings chapter 17. Their dwelling place of the land of Israel was lost. Where once they feared no man and they dwelt safely under God's hand and under their own kings of David and Solomon. It was a land where once their father Jacob or Israel, the old lion, had walked. He who sired them worked for them and brought them riches and a sense of nobility, giving them protection because of the fear of his God, the Holy One of Israel. His lionesses were Rachel, Leah, Bilah, and Zilpha, and the young lions were theirs and his children. The place of Israel's dwelling, as Nahum recalls, became a question mark in history. This she of the house of Israel, of the land of the lions, became swallowed up in other Gentile nations, and they without a distinguishing feature, so she became void, empty, and waste, until under the guise of other nations she came into the isles to dwell safely once more. And Ezekiel tells us of the lionesses and sings the song of lamentation for Israel's lions. <coughs> You see that in Ezekiel 19, 1 through 9. Let's read that. Ezekiel 19, 1 through 9 says, And you take up a lamentation for the princes of Israel and say, What was your mother? A lioness? Among lions she crouched. In the midst of young lions she reared her cubs, and she brought up one of her cubs. He became a young lion, and he learned to catch prey, and he devoured men. The nations heard about him. He was caught up in their pit, and they brought <coughs> him with hooks into the land of Egypt. When she saw that she waited in vain, that her hope was lost, she took another of her cubs and made him a young lion. He prowled among the lions. He became a young lion, and he learned to catch prey. He devoured men and seized their widows. He laid waste their cities, and the land was appalled and all who were in it at the sound of his roaring. Then the nations set against him from provinces on every side. They spread their net over him, and he was taken in their pit with hooks. They put him in a cage and brought him to the king of Babylon. They brought him into the custody, or into custody, that his voice should be no more, should his voice should no more be heard on the mountains of Israel. So this, this uh this is a very poignant view of Israel. Right? In verse five, this she meaning Rachel or Israel's wife, for she is the mother of this young lion and the mother of the house of Israel who mourned for her child in the spirit of Israel. This young lion's heritage from verse 4, however, eventually became head of the house of Israel as an Ephraimite. Then the nations feared him. Yet his hope was lost because of his evil ways. The Assyrians plundered him and took him away in chains. Then Israel took another young lion called Benjamin with Judah and made him head of the other young lions. Then Judah became more important than the others after Joseph was sold into Egypt. Judah found favor within all Israel when then, and he became favored uh, ruler over Israel. He was called David. The young lion was out of the house of Judah, a most favored strong lion indeed. And he became a mighty warrior. And in verse 8, it says, Then the nations set it against him on every side. You know, all of these provinces came against him. Right? And uh, these David's name is also Judah, out of Jacob, the second chosen young lion out of the whole nation of Israel. So when David died, his kingdom of Judah's lineage made war with all Israel. 
when his name was called Rehoboam, this man or lion caused them, causing them in a, uh, a state to divide or become provinces, right? They spread their net over him, and he was taken in their pit. For when David the young lion subjugated Damascus of Syria and ruled that city, Israel had much trouble with Syria, Syria after that. Hazael, king of Syria, ravaged the provinces of Reuben, Manasseh, and northern Israel. When Judah had another young lion, called Ahaz, king of Judah, he fell into the pit set for him on every side of the provinces. Because Ahaz, <coughs> Ahaz roared and made a great noise, yet was a foolish young lion. In one day, 12,000 men of Judah fell in battle, and Pekah, king of Israel, took 200,000 men, women, and children captive. Rezin, king of Damascus, also took captives. Judah was then invaded by the provinces of Edomites and the Philistines, so the nations and provinces set upon him on every side, just as the verse says. The pit was dug and the trap sprung. And then Ahaz, king of Judah, asked Syria for help, then under King Tiglath-Pileser, who also distressed him. You see that in Second Chronicles 28, uh, verse 20. And this was to prove their eventual fall into the Assyria-Babylon um, net, if you will. And it says that they put him in a cage and brought him to the king of Babylon. So this, this to be put in a cage is to be in a ward, is to have a watchman or guardian in confinement, in custody. So he's brought into custody. They brought him into chains. <clears throat> he was brought before Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. In 2 Chronicles 36.10 and 2 Kings chapter 24. So when someone is kept in chains or in holds, it is to be confined and kept as a prisoner, to be detained and kept fast and held in a place of security. And it says, so that his voice should no more be heard on the mountains of Israel. This voice of a roaring lion or king could not give a command to his people. His authority had been lost forever. And in Numbers 24, 5 and 9, we see all the tribes of Israel according to their two camps as a lion. Let's take a look at that. It says, How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your encampments, O Israel. He crouched, he lay down like a lion, and like a lioness, who will rouse him up? Blessed are those who bless you, and cursed, cursed are those who curse you. All right? This, uh, these two camps, your encampments, is a reference to the two camps of Jacob and Israel. Now, Gad, it is said in Deuteronomy 33.20, it says, And of Gad, he said, Blessed be he that enlarges Gad. He dwells as a lion and tears the arm with the crown of the head. And we know that our master, Jesus Yehoshua the Messiah was called the Lion of the tribe of Judah in Revelation 5.5. 5. We see um, in 33.20 it says, And of Gad he said, Blessed be he who enlarges Gad. Gad crouches like a lion. He tears off arm and scalp. And then over in Revelation 5.5 5 it says, And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. So even the called remnant from out of the two camps of the nation Israel, which are Zion and Jerusalem, are called lions. 
in Jeremiah 51, 35 and 38. Let's look at that. Jeremiah 51, 35. The violence done to me and to my kinsmen be upon Babylon. Let the inhabitant of Zion save. My blood be upon the inhabitants of Chaldea. Let Jerusalem save. They shall roar together like lions. They shall growl like lions' cubs. And this, this violence done to me and my kinsmen, my flesh, these, this is the nation of all Israel. So this chapter of history gradually unfolds into the last days of mankind's strength in the nations on earth, which brings about the amalgamation of roaring voices as Israel's lions, all together again at the, their last end. So at the very end, Israel is brought back together with Judah, all Israel, both houses. The roaring comes out of Zion, of the house of Israel, and of Jerusalem, out of the house of Judah. They will be able to roar or yell from their dens when they are strong nations again. And Jeremiah tells us that when they were in their own land of north or south Israel, they were overcome with stronger lines, that of Assyria and Babylon. Yet have these lion's whelps of Israel survived and prevailed throughout the long centuries. Israel had running sores of wickedness within uh, that lion's pride, so it was taken prisoner when its head was too sick to defend itself. So God, the chief lion, destroyed its majesty in the earth. Look at Hosea chapter 5, verse 14. It says, For I will be like a lion to Ephraim, and like a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear and go away. I will carry off, and no one shall rescue. So that's really kind of the quick rundown of who the young lions um, are spoken of in Ezekiel chapter 38. And so if this is the case, there are some biblical students who now think that these verses in Ezekiel are indeed a pointer to the young lions of Britain and the Commonwealth country. One is unquestionably coming to this conclusion for the wrong reasons, not looking at these nations as tribes of Israel. The lions in heraldry, which these British nations use, is something we must have a quick look at also. Heraldry, or the code of, uh, use of the coat of arms on shields, dress, flags, etc., which depicts, as it were, an edited historical background of people's history, didn't officially come into being until the 21st, or, sorry, the 12th century. And though there are differences of opinion among scholars whether ancient insignia is also heraldry, um, it is a science of heredity governed by laws answerable to the sovereign and has been used extensively by nations throughout the world. So when we look at Israel's young lions as an insignia in heraldry, it doesn't read that way to some scholars. The expression, the lion of the tribe of Judah, is not true heraldry, scholars say. Yet it is a symbol or a standard which shows the strength of that tribe, and it's always or, or uh, a symbol of the strength of that tribe and its ways of coping with difficulties informing the peoples who see it to beware and take note. So the ancient civilizations also had insignia and symbols as artifacts and historical records have shown us of Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. The Bible tells us of some of these symbols or on standards or ensigns or banners raised for the people to inform them of their roots and of which tribe to follow. Note Israel's standards that were raised in the book of Numbers, chapter 1, verse 52, and Numbers 2, verse 2. 
Let's look at Numbers 2, verse 2. It says, The people of Israel shall camp each by his own standard, or ensign, or flag, with the banners of their fathers' houses. They shall camp facing the tent of meeting on every side. So each of these ensigns for each tribe would bear their fauna and flora, as it were, which was given at their birthright. Hence the sentence, the lion of the tribe of Judah, given in Revelation 5.5, 5, showing Jesus' descent from Judah. It is possible that if our if the standard of Christ were raised today, that it would bear the insignia of an old lion representing Jacob and Israel, a young lion representing Judah, a star and scepter, which is Jesus's personal sign from Numbers 24, 17. So let's turn there. Numbers 24, 17 says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Now, angels are also referred to as stars. Let's not forget that. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all of the sons of Seth, or Sheth. So, we would perhaps uh, read also of the standards or flags of the nation of Israel in the same manner, with each having its own armorial insignia but always with an old lion representing Jacob and Israel. It seems that we can also call Israel's standards true heraldry, which biblically is always of an hereditary factor because the lions of Israel began their heraldry in the wilderness um, thousands of years ago. So today, those same lions as insignia remain in the house of Israel, lands of British stock and upon the, their adopted countries, which are indeed continuing emblems in the last days of which Ezekiel speaks. The old lion in the thinking processes of modern times is represented by Mother England, and the young lions that of her dominions or commonwealth countries. They who would bear their lineage out of British stock in the colors and insignia of lions in their respective flags, etc. So we're dealing with the lions of the house of Israel here in Ezekiel, as the verses of scripture indicate. The British insignia of the lion and the unicorn are far more impressive as at first perceived by mankind. Biblically, the lion represents Jacob and Israel, who is the father of this nation. The unicorn represents Joseph, who is head and strength of this nation throughout their checkered past. Heraldic writers tell us that the unicorn as a fabulous animal is mentioned by Greek and Roman authors as a native of India. The unicorn is represented as a horse or a kid with a single horn in its forehead which was also portrayed by the Assyrians on reliefs. And it's also said that the mystery of this mythological creature stemmed from the fact that the Crusaders saw wild antelopes of Syria and Palestine armed with long, straight, spiral horns set close together. And uh, when they turned sideways, the two horns appeared to become one. So whatever the animal was, the unicorn represents Joseph and Israel biblically. And Deuteronomy uh, 13 to 17 shows that. So let's look at that. Here it says, and of Joseph, he said, blessed be the Lord, blessed be Yehovah, or blessed by Yehovah be his land with the choicest gifts of heaven above and of the deep that crouches beneath with the choicest fruits of the sun and the rich yield of the months, with the finest produce of the ancient mountains and the abundance of the everlasting hills, with the best gifts of the earth and its fullness in favor of him who dwells in the bush. May these rest on the head of Joseph, 
on the pate of him who is prince among his brothers. A firstborn bull, he has majesty, and his horns are the horns of a wild ox. With them he shall gore the peoples, all of them to the ends of the earth. They are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and the thousands, and are the thousands of Manasseh. And again, we have to look at a different version to get uh, the meaning here because the ESV kind of obscures it. And, you know, it says uh, in verse 33, 17, the KJV says, His glory is like the firstling of his bullock, and his horns are like the horns of unicorn. Right? And here it says uh, wild ox. So maybe it's a translation thing, I'm not sure. But suffice it to say, this is speaking of, of Israel and Judah. So here it seems is the hand of God in Britain's heraldry. Each individual nation in the British Isles has its quote-unquote lion in the sovereign standard, that of Scotland, Wales, Ireland, and England. The Commonwealth countries and the young lions of America came out of all these lions, and all of the Israelite tribes, these young lions. They populated the far-reaching dominions ruled by the old lion of British Israel. Joseph has nurtured them from his prolonged blessing from God over the centuries. The lion of Judah's house was mixed among the people when dispersed in the Gentile and other nations. He was also nurtured by Joseph and lived to be identified in the nations as the Jew. In the Gentiles was Jesus, um, um, in the Gentiles was Jesus, Israel's great lion of the tribe of Judah. This then is the identification of the young lions of Ezekiel 38. Knowing also we are here unraveling again another facet of the history of the British Isles or the nation of the house of Israel. And this is a very complex, complete, far reaching and tremendous interpretation or translation, no doubt. And, you know, it's, been, it's going to require a lot more study to, to really get it cemented into our brains. So we go back to Ezekiel 38, 13. And finish the translation therein. We've found that this verse speaks of Sheba and Dedan, or present-day Saudi Arabia and of the Arabian Peninsula the land with great spoils of oil. We have the merchants of Tarshish, or present-day Spain, who will have the control of the sea gates of Gibraltar. Both these, both these lands under monarchies. We have the young lions of Israel's nations also, which are present-day British Isles and Commonwealth countries and the United States of America. Within them is great wealth and resources, a great spoil indeed for Russia. It will happen as the rest of verse 13 says, Have you assembled your host to carry off plunder, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, to seize great spoil? And we'll go back now to the remainder of Ezekiel 38.18 to finish the tying up of where Gog or Russia will attack on this all-out war front that envelops the whole world. We'll look at verse 18. It says, But on that day, the day that Gog shall come against the land of Israel, declares Adonai Yehovi, my wrath will be roused in my anger. Both Ezekiel and Daniel are telling us the same story, as does Revelation 6, during these last days of prophecy, though in very different translations and interpretations, a different way of presenting it. The prophets have told us 
of Russian power of sub subversion within nations. Look at what's happening in the United States today. If you don't see socialist communist influence in this country, you're walking around with your eyes closed. In these set up tabernacles and of the friends at Russian steps when overtaking Egypt, etc. And it will seem as if Russian power is almost absolute over other countries. World War III, however, will eventually be one of ruin for all sides, and especially for those Russian peoples and their desires. Since the ride of the red horse of Revelation 6, 3 and 4, we have had two world wars and many small wars it has already brought about. And we've been living in a war-tormented 20th and 21st century. There are too many uncertainties that lie in the paths of these Israelite nations spoken of in prophecy, which could be their undoing and was foreseen many years ago. These quote-unquote tabernacles spoken of by Daniel are firmly placed in the thinking and structure of, in these Israelite lands, weakening all the Western democratic nations. This communist thought process which tends towards atheism. If the scenario during World War III is for Russia to come through the continent of Europe, then causing an uprising within Britain through subversion with a full-scale attack from the air, then Britain's problems will be very acute indeed. When Ezekiel saw into our century by making the statement that Russia will ascend and come like a storm cloud to cover the land, Ezekiel was seeing air bombardments, or at least potentially seeing air bombard bombardments uh, of great magnitude, which were unheard of in his day that long ago. The air threat to the British Isles is very real indeed, just as it was in the Second World War. The need in the Isles, as in the American continent, is to repair, reorganize, and to make better provisions for its air defenses. Public and government opinion over national security should not be relaxed when the peace calls escalate. Right? And what I think we're seeing this right now. But rather, much vigilance, vigilance in all spheres should prevail. But knowing how apathetic these people can be from past history, caution will take a back seat until sudden destruction is spoken by the Messiah. It's until that destruction is let loose on them. And this apathy and unreadiness we saw clearly in history in the run-up to two world wars, the British Isles and you, the United States must make an absolute quick defense system for a conventional war at least. They cannot escape Russian attention from its air force, which is obvious from prophecy. Britain is so small and out in the seas on its own, uh, who is very vulnerable to air attacks on a much grander scale than we saw in World War II. With Russia commanding land, air, and sea around the Isles, the Russians will come in like a storm. Even if the situation in the Isles is as a floating armament depot for the USA and the continent in the event of an all-out war against Russian aggression, this alone will make her a target for much air attack. The United States and Canada will not escape either because this indeed is a war to end all wars toward the desire of others to end the life of the two nations of Israel in Jew and Gentile. So brethren, this is really a, a peek into what could be the potential future for the British peoples, the United States, Canada, um, it's, I wouldn't go so far that, uh, to say that it's absolute, 
but given what we've studied over this time, it certainly seems plausible and is something that, uh, given what we've studied, we should be watching for. Um, this, you know, there is a continued animosity between the United States and, and Russia that seems to be growing. Uh, if you pay attention to the headlines, you'll, you'll see it. So uh, that concludes this five-part study. Um, we will cover other sections of this work um, in upcoming studies, but we will conclude uh, uh, this section uh, today. So hopefully you found it interesting. It was a lot of information and uh, we'll publish this on the website. Um, it needs to be cleaned up a bit, but we will publish it. Um, it's uh, the author gave uh, rights to publish it, so we will do that. And I think uh, we'll put it out there for people to study, for sure. So with that, we will, uh, we will end our uh, formal service with a hymn and a closing prayer. So if you will please stand, we'll have our final hymn and we'll close our formal service and we'll be back with our open discussion period. So if you would please stand for the final hymn and open your hymnals to page 72. On page 72, we'll sing our final hymn, which comes from Psalm 95, titled, O Come and Let Us Worship Him. After which, I would like to call upon Mr. Eric Aristide to close in prayer. But first, page 72, O oh, come and let us worship him.